Hello, I'm Bruce Apar, and this is my co-host, Frank J. Rich, and you're watching Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog. Welcome again to Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog. This is the weekly community affairs show where we have a very diverse range of great guests and great topics. Uh, and our mission, you might say, is to showcase all the good things that happen and all the good people in our community. You might be one of them. And if you do want to uh, get on the show and, and have something to talk about, please feel free to email us at editor at pennysaver community.com. And speaking of Penny Saver, we are brought to you every week by the Penny Saver and our parent company, Chase Media Group. And we thank, of course, our CEO, Carla Chase, and Frank J. Rich, my co-host, for putting us up on the show every week. And we want to right away get to our special guest, a good friend, uh, Judge Sal Lagonia. Good morning. Uh, and I've known Sal for, for a number of years. And uh, he is the judge. He is a town justice in Yorktown, along with Judge Gary Raniolo. Correct. But Sal has a lot of different things he does and does very well, and so we have a lot we're going to talk about today on the show. So again, welcome, Sal. It's Thank great you. to have you nice here. Nice to be here. Yeah. Um, we were, t were talking before we went on how uh, your path to the bench, as it were, which is a, uh, one of the things you do, uh, is that you had been a police officer for 20 years, right, yeah. in, in Newcastle. Yeah. Uh, you're a practicing lawyer, uh, and three years ago you were elected to your first term as town justice in, in Yorktown. Uh, how common is it for somebody to have like a law enforcement background and become a judge? I mean, lawyers, judges usually are lawyers, so right. that's, that's very common. Or, or Actually, in this, year, in this area, they're, they're usually lawyers. You go upstate, they're, they're non-lawyer judges, too, right. Right. Uh, which have to be certified, and you know, they go through certain training. But I only know of one other police officer who became a judge recently, anyway, uh, in, my, in my recent uh, travels. Um, but it, it's a good training. It's great. It, it was good training for me to get some street knowledge, uh, then go into the defense end of, of practicing law, and, and now, you know, sitting as the judge, uh, a totally different concept of, of the law. But if you love the law, and if you love people especially, you know, it, it's something that kind of just fits in. And it was a nice evolution for me, anyway. And, of course, uh, you work very closely with uh, local law enforcement, in this case the Yorktown Police Department, but, of course, you work, I'm sure, with other p police departments. We have nine different police yeah. agencies feeding our court business. Right. Um, so you, you, you have a vast array of law enforcement agencies from the state police, the county, and all that. Of course, our closest relationship is with our local police, the Yorktown Police, who are just a fantastic bunch of officers yes. who do... Uh, so much hard work, and, and, and I've got to say, when we get their, their paperwork in, into the courtroom, whether it be for a, a complaint or whether it be a search warrant or whatever it is, usually impeccable. So it, it's so much easier to work with people who are really professional and know what they're doing. And what is the, uh, you know, just generally speaking, the nature of the, the kinds of cases that come before you in a, you know, in a suburban community like Yorktown or, or, you know, which could be other northern Westchester towns as well. Well, you know, the Yorktown court handles every case that happens in Yorktown. Um, and so we get anything from, you know, your most mundane parking tickets uh, right on up to uh, a homicide investigation, an assault investigation, uh, anything serious. Um, now, the felony cases will eventually find themselves down into the county court. Uh, but everything starts in Yorktown and starts with us. So we have to deal with at least the preliminary stages of each of those cases. And I imagine it, it, one of the big challenges uh, in your role on the bench is dealing with youthful offenders. Uh, because obviously they're at a stage in life where, you know, people make mistakes. Right. Uh, inadvertently, maybe, in some cases, or, or they're just... Uh, a little wayward. I mean, do you so? Do you deal with them differently than you would deal with an adult? 
Well, that uh, comes before the bench. You do, to yeah. some extent. Right. And, of course, my background is I, I ran a juvenile office in, in, in the police department. So, for me, right. that's, that's something closer to my heart than, than anything else. Um, we, we tried some new things. We, we've tried new things in the court uh, where we uh, don't immediately try to push a case through. We try to watch the case for a while try to get help for the youthful offender because that's the person you're going to be able to help the best. Right. You know, you get a, a 30 and 40 year old criminal, it, it's a lot harder to find places for them to get to get the assistance they need. You get a young kid, that, that may be where you make the, the turn. Um, and so a lot of times now what we've done, and D Judge Raniello has signed on to this as well, is we'll delay a case out, make them get their, their, their evaluations, make them get treatment if they need uh -huh. it, especially in drug cases. Um, and then report back to the court on a regular basis, so something we call our compliance part, to make sure they're complying with what we've told them to do. Right. Because once we sentence them, we, we have no more control over them. They're right. out there and either going to repeat what they did or maybe do something worse. So what we'd rather do is have some control for a while, maybe get them back on the right track, and we've had some success in that area. Um, and if we can do that, then you know, obviously that will keep our workload down for the future. Right. You know, and as, as we say at the, at the top of each show, you know, we do like to point to role models. I mean, there's enough places you can go in today's world, unfortunately, to read about bad things that happen. So one of the things that Frank and I like to showcase is, you know, how people can look to uh, other people, um, you know, f as role models. Right. And I know in that regard, you're very involved with the Yorktown Youth Court, which the Alliance for Safe Kids in Yorktown uh, helps administer it, and that's a case where we, you take what, basically high school students and teach them, right, right. the whole uh, judicial process, really. We, we yeah. do, right, right. From, from, from the bottom to the top. Right. Um, they, they, they are the defendants, they are the lawyers, they are the judges, uh, the court officers, all of, all of the judicial system. They understand the judicial system when they complete their course probably better than 90% of American adults. Right. Um, <laughs> and they do such a great job, and then they hear actual cases, they hear real cases. So if we get a very minor case, a case where, for example, uh, skateboarding on a on a you know a public property someplace, right. we will have them actually determine oh, the what actual the case? sentence will be for the re for the actual case for the actual case. Oh, now we of, of course everybody has to agree. We usually bring the parents in of the defendant. We bring the defendant and make them all understand that they could sit through a court calendar with all of the assault cases, DWI cases, or they can go to the youth court. The interesting thing is the youth court probably sentences much more severely than we do. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so well, that's, that's literally a jury of their peers, it's right? It's a jury of their peers, <laughs> in, right. in essence, and it, they, they can only sentence to community service, uh, but usually pretty stiff community service sentences. And many of the defendants become youth court members later on. And in fact, one youth court member I know expressed a very strong interest to go to law school after it was all over. So it's got a lot of positive effects in the community. I, right. uh, the ASK group has yeah. done some wonder, as you well yes. know, yeah. one wonderful thing in our community. Yes. Uh, we open the court to them, uh, and, and uh, both judges are, are there to help them, and the police department's very involved in it as well. It's just a, a really great program. One of those big success stories. Is there? Um, uh, a tradition of youth courts in the, across the country, or is this a unique uh, application? There, there are youth courts elsewhere, um, and in fact, I had one when I was the youth officer in Newcastle. I had a small youth court. Um, it, it, one of the biggest problems they've always had is not having enough cases to keep the kids interested. Mm. So what we've done here is we've reached out to the probation department to, to refer cases, but also from the bench, we now, both judges, take a proactive view of it and say, look, here's an alternative Instead of having us make the decisions, the guy with the you know, long robe on, um, let's, let's let your peers talk about it. Let's see what they say about it to you. And it's, it's got much more of an impact on the defendant themselves because they're yeah. hearing it from their friends, the people right. they have to see in school. Another interesting part of it, though, which I, I, I love, those youth court members have to be totally confidential as to who's in front of them. Well, they are. And we found, we, that was one of my biggest fears when we first started this thing. They go into the school as if they don't know this person and never mention it to anybody. And it's just worked out so beautifully right. over the years. And we've done this a number of years now. It's been so successful. So uh, I'm looking forward to where we're actually starting a new session right now. And uh, I get to teach in another week or so. And uh, we, we put on these programs constantly for these kids. And then there is, which I've attended, of course, there's a graduation ceremony. It's, it's really ceremony. nice. Yeah, yeah it really it's is. Very, And it's great. You know, one of the best parts of that is to see the beaming, well, 
as with any graduation, the way it should be anyhow, but this is a, a different type. Uh, see the beaming parents, uh, yeah. you know, that fill the, uh, yeah. the courtroom and things. And they should yep. be, and they should be proud of their <laughs> children and proud of themselves for putting the children into that That's program. Right, yeah. So, so you're, uh, Judge Lagoni, you're what's sometimes called a polymath because you have diverse interests and you're a master of many of them. One of them being uh, you're uh, not only an airline uh, pilot, private pilot, but that's one of your specialties, right, in practicing law, and you represent the, uh, well, one of the aviation groups, uh, uh, association. Um, yeah. I, I've always said I, I, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up, but, <laughs> um, but, but aviation's always been a, a love of mine. I learned to fly at a fairly young age, uh, gave it up for a while. Uh, and I uh, got pushed back into it by my wife, which was a good thing. She was tired of seeing me look up in the sky every time a <laughs> plane fell, flew over. Um, went back and got, a, got my license again and, and, uh, and bought an airplane. And right. very involved in the angel flight groups uh, where we, we fly poor patients uh, to their medical uh, treatments. Right. And so that's become kind of a little mission to make me keep flying more. But a couple of years ago, I, I met a, a, an aviation lawyer who, um, who enticed me to, to go into that field, and, and I uh, went and trained for that, and, uh, and now I'm one of the aviation lawyers in the area. There are very few, believe right. it or not, so it's a nice, nice niche to have. Um, but we represent the AOPA, which um, has a legal panel all around the country of lawyers that they refer to. And the AOPA is the biggest aviation group in, in the country. And what does that stand for? The, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Right. They have something like 500,000 members. Wow. Yeah. So and, and how long have you been flying? I've been flying since 1979. Wow. So it's been, over uh, 30 been a while. Years. Yeah, yeah. Well, over, over 30 years. And, when, and where did your interest come from? Why did you want to get up my, there? My mom you know, claims it was in the, ca in the carriage in the Bronx when I was growing up watching a plane fly into LaGuardia. <laughs> I wouldn't take my eyes off it across the entire sky. <laughs> she said, I knew then <laughs> that you'd be flying, and I guess she was right. Mm. And, and how, that's always fascinated me because, you know, actually there's a famous book called Fear of Flying. Uh, you know, obviously, it's not exactly like driving a car. I mean, so how how hard is it to learn to learn how to you know man the controls? It, and it's certainly not as easy right. as driving a car. Right. I mean, we we used to push that. We used to say, oh, if you can drive a car, you can fly a plane. Not quite. <laughs> um, although it's 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 not as hard, I think, as some people think. Um, when you get into the more advanced ratings, like an instrument rating, which I, which I my, I achieved about four or five years ago, um, that's where it gets very difficult. That allows you to fly in bad weather. That allows you to fly, you know, over some of the major airports and into the major airports. Um, so there are there's there are other advanced ratings you can get if you really want to spend the time and, and, and take the time to do it. Right. But the, the basic pilot's license, you know, if mm -hmm. you if you're a reasonable uh, commitment to it, it it can be done, and it's not as uh, as expensive as people think either. It's something to try. Oh. And in this country right now, we have an extremely uh, shortage of, of pilots. We're at the lowest level of pilots we've ever been since World War II. You mean what? Commercial pilots? All or pilots. All pilots in pilots. general right. are at the lowest rate now that we've ever had. Why do you think that is? Many reasons. Um, a lot of reasons are expense. Uh, you know, fuel prices now in right. aviation are extremely high. And so when people go as, as kids to try to learn how to fly, they're having to pay higher prices than they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And what kind of plane do you own? I own a Cessna Cardinal, which is a four-seater. Uh, we keep it at White Plains Airport. Uh, and it's a great little airplane. You can, uh, you can, you know, it has big doors on it, which is great for the angel flight right. uh, trips because sometimes my patients can't uh, maneuver as, as as well as everybody else. So these huge doors, they can get in the airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the the best story I love telling about the angel flight is we we uh, I had a flight to Boston Logan Airport one day, and I put this young kid from Ghana in the back of the airplane, and I put the headsets on him. And because I go into Logan, I take a second pilot with me, so we we filled the front seats. Mm -hmm. And we put the headset on, and all the way up, I'm telling stupid jokes. <laughs> and, I mean, my jokes are extremely corny, and he is laughing at every joke I tell. I'm saying, this is the greatest audience I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Captain. We, we land at Logan, and I go in the back to disconnect his headset, and I realize it was never plugged in. He never heard a word I said. <laughs> oh, my gosh. He was just laughing because as serious as the disease he had, he was looking out the window and seeing us uh, smiling and uh, just being happy to uh, forget oh, about it for that hour that it yeah. took us to fly up there. Yeah. So it was just, you know, I, I thought it was, I was a great uh, comedian, but I guess I'm not. I was going to say, so you were telling the jokes, but he was humoring you. That was absolutely <laughs> That's right. sort of what happened. Right? Absolutely right. And I know, Sal, um, I forget the circumstances, and that's why I'm asking you, because I know it'll be interesting to share. Um, you were at the White House recently. I remember you telling me this story, right? Weren't you at the White House? You were at a, a Washington, D.C. event. I was um, at the Supreme Court at the Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what it was, the right. Supreme Court. And, and you, was, you were saying how... The well, effect that it had on you. Yeah, well, right. it was three years ago. I, right. I was asked by the Bar Association. Right. I'm the former president of the Westchester Bar. Right. 
and I was asked by the Bar Association to help them out and admit new lawyers to the Supreme Court. Right. And they had 11 lawyers who wanted to get admitted. In order to do that, an admitted attorney has to sponsor them and go down to right. Washington and present before the Supreme Court, before the nine justices. Right, that's and, what it was. Yeah. And well, we are, you go into a ready room before you go in there, which is beautiful, and the chief clerk comes out. They wear great tails every day. It's just a, <laughs> such a, a class operation. And he came out and he gave me my script, what I'm supposed to say to Chief Judge uh, John Roberts. And, and, and as I read this, the script, it was just before, it was right after I was elected, but it was before I, I took office. Right. And it said, Justice Salvatore Lagonia, and I said, Chief Clerk, I said, you can't say that. I'm really not the judge yet until January 1, and I'd hate to put that on the federal record. He says, you're absolutely right. He runs upstairs and comes back a few minutes later and hands me the exact same script. <laughs> and I said, Clerk, what am I supposed to do? He said, stop. He said, the Chief Judge has just ordered that from this day <laughs> forward, you will be known as what? Justice Salvatore oh, Lagonia. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I had this big smile on my face. <laughs> well. When, when the chief judge called my name and I got up in the well of the, of the court and had the nine justices, I'm nervous as could be, I got to tell you, <laughs> and I go to the podium, uh, John Roberts looked up at me and said, and now, Justice Sal Lagonia, <laughs> and he had this huge grin uh, on his oh, face. Wow. It was just That's such great. a nice moment yeah. that here I am trying to make a special moment for 11 lawyers. Yeah. The chief judge thought yeah. enough to make a special moment for me. So that was, it, it nice was just nice. Yeah. No, that's great. Very nice. Yeah. It gives a little humanity to a, right. a, a group of people who don't seem to have much. Right. Right. Sometimes you wonder. Well, I mean, <laughs> not that they don't. It's just that they don't appear to because right. of the, the veil that uh, covers them, so to speak, right. in yeah. most cases. And, and speaking of which, uh, what Frank just said sort of reminded me, because as, as you know, I've been to my share of uh, community functions, political and otherwise, and, um, you know, and covering them as, a, as working press. Um, and I don't know that a lot of people would be aware, but ju sitting judges, right, are not allowed to attend political right. fundraisers. I mean, are there any other restrictions like that on you? Well, we have lots of restrictions. Right. We can't practice certain areas of law uh, right. after we've got, you know, we, we were always called part-time judges, although if you look at my hour sheet, you probably would say, <laughs> wow, <laughs> how do you do it? Um, but we're not allowed to go to political offense except, uh, events except within the nine-month period prior to our election. So, because you obviously right. have to start running again. Right. And so now I'm within that, with that window period, I can actually start doing that again. Not that I'm so fast to do it, but, right. um, but we, we, we try to stay as unpolitical as possible. You know, we're not looking for Republican votes or Democrat votes. We're looking for everybody to say, look, this guy is fair. Right. I want to vote for him. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I would know this firsthand, you're not allowed to debate. You're not allowed Correct. to participate in debates. Correct. We're, we're, allowed to, we're not allowed to talk about issues of any type that might become, come before the court, certainly, and, and, not, and not political issues, certainly. We could talk about our experiences, which is you know, really what a judge has to, has to run on to begin with, uh, and, and talk about what we've done in the court. Yeah. Uh, getting back for a second to, the, to your uh, aviation passion, have you seen the movie Flight with... Have not. And so you have to see that because have uh, not. I mean it's based on a on a true incident, right. uh, not unlike uh, Sully, well, uh, Captain Sullenberger, what right. he did on the, uh, and, and and I know you've been on shows talking about that, the Miracle on the Hudson, as it's called. <coughs> what or? what happened was the right. one of the, two of the TV stations because I am an aviation lawyer, they called me the second it happened, huh. and I had no idea what was going on because I had not had the TV on in my office, and but the phone was ringing off the hook, and my secretary was going a little bit crazy. And she said, you better pick up one of them. And I, I got on and they said, look, you're on the air in three minutes. And I said, three minutes for what? Turned the TV on and saw the, the plane in the water. And we had to do some, some real catch up. And of course, my secretary, who is my wife, uh, mm -hmm. is sitting there handing me little notes about the flight because she was doing research on the internet uh -huh. real quick. And I sounded like I knew everything about this flight <coughs> when I had absolutely no idea what was going on. But as we watched the movies, we could, we, you know, we could see it. Um, and for the next two or three days, uh, the news trucks were parked out of my office and we were trying to give them updates on what we thought had happened at least. Mm. And some years later, I got actually a ch had a chance to talk to Stolenberger and uh, he is everything you see on TV. He yeah. is as calm, cool, and collected and professional as you, you And given the circumstances well. of that extraordinary uh, rescue, uh, is that something from your perspective as a pilot that you think you could have done or would have known what to do or other commercial pilots would have known what to do? Or? You, you hope you can. Right. You know, we, we train right. for all of this right. stuff. And, and, and we, we're always told stay off the water. 
but here he had absolutely no choice. Right. Um, but you hope you can do that. You hope you will maintain your calm to get through, you know, whatever it is. You know, I, I fly a single-engine airplane. If the engine stops, what do you do? You, you glide, you know, right. and you try to land somewhere, and you hope that you maintain your, your composure enough to do it. It's those who don't that really get themselves in trouble. And by the way, we do need to give a shout out to Loretta Lagonia. No question who is about it. She, uh, in her own right, she is a, a great community uh, organizer and, and community volunteer and uh, does so many things selflessly uh, for the community. And everybody loves her. So, I mean, everybody's me. in line behind <laughs> you, but everybody else. <laughs> um, so, so you were talking about the reason, or at least uh, the way your mother tells the story, you looked up in the sky when watching planes fly over. So now let's talk about your trumpet playing. Oh boy. Where did that come from? Did, did you used to watch Louis Armstrong movies? Or <laughs> no, I had, I had two very uh, uh, mus musical people in, in, in my life, my, my mom and dad. My dad was uh, loved jazz, um, and my mom was a classical uh, uh, person. And, and so I would have, you know, I'd wake up with Beethoven and go to sleep with Harry James. <laughs> um, and it was great because it gave me a good view of the music. I, when I was five years old... I would old, think you'd do the reverse. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Well, <laughs> my, my, you're, you're right. It probably should have been. What was it that wrote the lullaby? <laughs> probably it probably should have been. <laughs> lullaby song. But uh, at five years old, my dad would uh, bought me a, a, you know, an old... Uh, he used to call it the pea shooter. It was an old trumpet. And, and he put a little rug on the ground because we couldn't, I couldn't lift it. It was so heavy. And, uh, and I would blow Blow. through the trumpet. And as I got to high school, you know, they didn't know what to do with me. I, I was just playing so long at that point that, you know, the, the high school band really wasn't a place for me. So they would send me to other places to, to play. I hooked up with a Juilliard professor who was absolutely the best uh, that I could ask for. Um, oh, wow. uh, a guy named Peter Crino, who was uh, a monster of the trumpet, they call him. And for about 15 or 18 years, I studied with him. Mm. Um, and it, it was just great. I just loved the, the instrument. And for me, at the end of the day, either as a cop or later on as a lawyer and judge, it was something to do to, to calm down and to, right. you know, to put right. the day behind me. And always practiced at least an hour a day and always kept it up. And it wasn't until I met Jay-Z Joplin that I kind of came out of the shell and, and started playing in, in, in public again, which right. I hadn't done in some years. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you performed, uh, I know, at the winery with Daisy Jopling, yeah. and, and at the Paramount, have you performed? We didn't, uh, we didn't get didn't? to perform at the right. Paramount because right. it closed before, or it temporarily right. closed, hopefully, uh, uh, before we got there. But um, we, uh, I met Daisy at a, uh, uh, my wife and I were there on a Valentine's uh, wine pairing. Right. A great, great venue, yes. not only for people to watch acts, but for, for acts to meet. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's what exactly happened. I walked up to Daisy, didn't know her from anybody. She didn't know me. And uh, I explained to her there was a great Chris Bode song I loved. And it's played right. with Lucia Micarelli, who was a gr another great violinist. And had she ever heard it? She says, oh, I love it. And if I ever got a trumpet player who could play it, I would play that song. <laughs> and I looked at her almost sheepishly, and I said, well, you just did. <laughs> and she said, great. And, and uh, Tom DeCaro, the owner of the winery, said, let's put that in our, our anniversary show. We were going to mm. make this in May. Right. And give you, show you how trusting Daisy is. She, three days before the show, it was the first time she heard me play. She had no idea. I yeah. couldn't yeah. blow the instrument. And we played Emmanuel, which is just a beautiful song. And uh, we, they made us play it again a month later in, a, in another show. So it was, uh -huh. uh, it was, it was kind of nice to see. You know, she's such a big performer, such a yeah. great performer. Yes. Um, her giving you know, me the opportunity to play with her was just, was just great. Do you have any performances coming up? Or? Nothing yeah. scheduled. Uh, I'm playing with a band now, and I've um, uh, been asked to do some walk-ons in different other groups. So uh, we'll, I'll keep on doing that. Played a couple of weeks ago, but the, that was kind of a surprise. They, they handed me a trumpet and said, oh, by the way, play with the band. Right. I was at an, in the audience. And, and was, but it is <laughs> jazz you play as opposed to classical. Uh, I play both. Um, and I make it a point to always <clears throat> practice classical at least once or twice a week because it's, it's actually a different set of... Uh -huh. of, of movements with the lip and with the fingering uh, than jazz would be. Yeah. So I don't want to ever get into that groove where I forget what else mm. I'm doing. Well, it requires an extraordinary discipline to uh, accomplish all of these things mm -hmm. in, uh, in flying and music and, and judgeship and the like. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you owe that to? Is it, uh, are you really an Italian ac accountant at heart? <laughs> Uh, I don't. I, you know what is? I, I I like to do things I'm interested in, and and um, and you know, you, you, if you if you pick your time well, uh, and use it well, it it get it all gets done. My my hardest nights are the night I'm in court, when it goes late and I still need to practice the trumpet when I get mm, home. Yeah. 
um, which, you know, fortunately all my kids now are grown and out of the house, but when they weren't, they, you know, they, they had to go to sleep a little later uh, or put a mute in. <laughs> but, uh, so you make the time for it, you know, you make the time for what you love and what you want to do. Yeah, you know, one of the things we do want to touch on, uh, because time really flies on this show and we're getting down to about five minutes left, is the uh, sort of events of, of the day, as, as you might call it, uh, where a local newspaper published uh, to the chagrin, which is a mild word to use, of uh, anybody who owns a gun, um, a list of gun owners in Westchester and actually created an interactive online map where you can click on a location and see the name and address of the gun owner. Um, what are your thoughts on that and, and, and the ensuing controversy that has not, as we're recording the show, it still has not played out? Yeah, it still hasn't played yeah. out. And I guess it, it, it'll end up in the hands of a judge, which, which is probably where it belongs at this point. Um, you know, it, it, I, I, I received hundreds of phone calls from, from uh, former colleagues of mine in the police department. Because just because of this? There. Just because of this Just because of this. Because, yeah. because you, you, you have uh, ex-police officers in there, you have uh, district attorneys uh, who get pr gun permits listed with their address, judges uh, mm -hmm. are certainly listed throughout Westchester County. Uh, it puts them in, in, a, in a bit of jeopardy, and, and certainly I can understand why they would be upset about it. Um, but what it also does, which I think a lot of people don't think about, is it also gives a, a, a potential criminal mm -hmm. a, a list of ho homes that don't have guns or <coughs> don't have legal guns anyway. We ne we'll never know. You know they, they, their reason for putting them in there was so that everyone would know where the guns are. Well, we don't. We, we, by using that list, we still mm -hmm. don't know where unregistered guns are or where long guns are or, right. or any of that stuff. But by putting the, num the names of people who have definitely have a registered firearm, who obviously passed the background checks and were trained, you're now setting that neighbor house who doesn't have one listed as a target. Right. Because that person, you know now, if you're a burglar, you want to go through that front door, you're not going to get shot, probably, right. um, unless the neighbor comes from next door to help you. So, so it, you know, it, 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 I think a little bit misguided on their part. Um, I, I think it's going to have to play out. There are exceptions in the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, um, that that could be in, invoked, including commercial use of these things, um, that perhaps will be made wider now by the legislature. But that's probably where it's going to have to be corrected for the long term. Mm -hmm. and, and Westchester County, of course, released the information to the newspaper. Putnam County, uh, so far, is refusing to release it. It's been pointed out that an irony, you might say, in all this is that the newspaper said it did it in the wake of the Sandy Hook. Uh, shooting in Connecticut, and yet the law in Connecticut is that they can't release the information. Correct. They can't release gun. So, so you're saying that uh, in New York State they're going to probably review the law? And uh, I, I believe they uh, are. I think Senator Ball mentioned that he's going to be putting forth legislation, and it's bipartisan, uh, right. to at least protect the names of, of those people. Um, and in many states, it is restricted. It, you know what? We, we want people to register guns so that we make sure they get trained, they make sure their background is good. Right. Um, we don't want uh, to have them now become targets because of that. And, and it should not be something that's just totally disseminated without some controls over it. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, w with respect to the rule of law, which is at issue here, uh, obviously, um, we, we see or hear often the president has uh, said this, that uh, that right thinking and uh, good practice uh, sometimes requires that the law catch up. Um, we uh, I just saw the, the film Lincoln. Almost the same statement was made by the character who played uh, President Lincoln. Um, yeah, you, Daniel you, Day Lewis. You so. must have a point yeah. of view about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we only have about 15 <laughs> seconds. Okay. Well, have to, you know, judges have to have to go with precedent, you know, and they have to go with what the law is. And as Judge Scalia once said, sometimes a good and faithful judge is not going to like his conclusion. And sometimes I don't like my conclusions in court, but they're the ones based on precedent, and that's what's most important. Yeah. Anyway, judge yeah. and friend, Sal Lagonia, thanks so much for being <laughs> Thank with you. us. Thank yeah. you. Very Great interesting to be here. show. We could easily do several of these with you. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for being here, and thank you for watching. And be sure to tune in next time and every time. You can also see the show on YouTube if you just search for uh, NCN Local TV. And remember, when Bruce the Blog listens, people talk.